we heal as a team, we're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen, believe me. And we can stay here, get the shish kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back, way back, way back into the light. Into the light, into the light. We can climb out of hell, out of hell, out of hell. One inch at a time. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from. I mean, that's that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's as game in inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now, I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now, I think you're going to see a guy you're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it you're gonna do the same for him that's the team gentlemen and either we heal now as a team or we will die as individuals individual, 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 individual. ideas are bulletproof Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Happy New Year. It is January 1st, 2012. This is Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye from federaljack.com, and it is my pleasure to bring you the very first edition of Down the Rabbit Hole for 2012 on this very first day of January. And right off the bat, we start off 2012 uh, I guess you could say kind of in a somber mood, uh, looking at what has been crammed down our throats in the past few days. I'm sure by now most of the listeners have heard that Barack Obama signed the NDAA into law, which means that martial law is now officially law inside the United States. So we now have pretty much martial law. You, the uh, Constitution has been officially eviscerated, and uh, there are other other pieces of legislation that have helped do it. But this, this, and not the fact that they already aren't doing this, but now they're just making what they do legal. So the Constitution is null and void. So, Happy New Year, ladies and gentlemen. And to anybody that still thinks that Barack Obama's a good guy, pull your head out of your ass and take a gander at what's been going on. Because he's just as bad, if not worse, than Bush. He's a puppet like all the rest, and he does what he's told by his New World Order masters. He does what he's told. You know, like in the movie, um, I can't remember, the, one of the Hannibal Lecter movies, I forget, Silence of the Lambs. You know, it puts the lotion on the skin or it gets the hose again. Well, that's pretty much what they tell him. They bring these presidents into a room and they sit down, and up on the movie screen comes this never-before-seen angle of the JFK assassination. And they watch it for a few minutes, and then the, the film you know, dies down, the lights come up, and a couple people say over the loudspeaker, you know, just one booming voice actually just comes over the loudspeaker and says, Any questions? 
And of course, the new president says no, and then does what he's does what he's told. And that's why they fear Dr. Paul, because I don't think he would acquiesce to everything that they'd want him to do. Why do you think they attack him in the media the way they do? It's rather pathetic, actually. It really is rather pathetic. Uh, I re-uploaded a video to Federal Jack Tube 6, my YouTube channel, uh, or one of them, I should say. Uh, and it's one of the ones with the active uploads. And it, uh, I, I can upload full-length stuff there. But uh, if you go over there and you check it out, it's uh, it's this epic media fail coverage of the Iowa caucus, you know, versus uh, 2008 versus 2012, and you'll see, you know, how the the mainstream media has just been, you know, in in 2007 going into 2008, it was, oh my God, it's of the utmost importance, you know, this will make or break, blah blah blah, president, you know, or excuse me, back then it was candidate Obama, you know, won won Iowa, and you know, oh. You know, angels were harps were floating around, and now all of a sudden it's Ron Paul that stands to win Iowa, and it's uh, Iowa doesn't really matter. Eh, if Paul wins it, that means Iowa is uh, you know Iowa politics doesn't mean anything, or if Iowans vote for Ron Paul, that doesn't I guess that means he doesn't count, or that doesn't mean anything. He's crap. That's basically what they're saying. I mean, the mainstream media, everybody in Iowa should be offended. They're st- they're saying you people are stupid. They're saying you don't even count. Your vote doesn't mean anything. They say if you vote for Ron Paul that Iowa politics should be questioned. Why the attacks on Dr. Paul? Because he wants freedom? Does that make any sense to any of you, ladies and gentlemen? Really? The guy just talks about freedom. He just talks about things that the, the proper way. Oh, I forgot this country's a bunch of warmongering idiots. And there still are a lot of idiots in this country that we should bomb Iran next. We kicked our racks ass and we, we, we were kicking ass in Afghanistan. We should, we should go. That's spitting tobacco. We should go into, uh, we should hit Iran and the rest of them tell Russia to kiss our ass and tell China, you better watch your back, you slanty eyed bastards. Right. Because that attitude's worked for the past 10 years, right? We're not the same America that we used to be. We're not the same country that we used to be. We don't have the respect around the world that we used to have. And the major problem and the major reason for that is because of the general public, the apathy. And when people go, well, how could they be so apathetic? It's because they've been brainwashed, ladies and gentlemen. Most of these people are dumber than a box of hammers. They wouldn't know what to do with common sense if it sat down in their lap with an instruction manual on how to use it. It's really, really, really sad. Okay. In fact, Russia today uh, did they they did like their man on the street thing. I'll play it uh, next segment because it's a couple minutes long. But they did like a man on the street type thing, and it, it was just ridiculous because they. You you couldn't the people could barely give two they could care less about what was going on. Most people had no clue about Libya, none, none. They they even run into an Air Force guy in his camis and they ask him and he knows nothing. So I was like Colonel Clink, I know nothing. I mean, it just people are so out of touch. People are so out of it, they have no idea. I mean, when I say out of touch, they, they're, people know more about uh, you know, sports stars' stats than they do you know, who Kim Jong-il is. Most people didn't even know who Ahmadinejad, the, the chick from RT, is showing them pictures of him. And they're like, the one guy's like the president of Iraq, or one chick was like the president of Iraq. I mean... It, it, it's insane, ladies and gentlemen. These people have no brain power. If you collectively took all these people and, and plugged them in together, you'd have enough to make toast. That's why this country is in the shape it's in. Why do you think they can pass these laws? Everybody goes, I don't understand how these politicians get away with it. I do. Look at the general public. Yeah, there's a large percentage of the populace that are pissed off and getting awakened. 
But we all used to be part of that dumbed down pu- public. So we need – our New Year's resolution should be to wake more and more people up. And I really believe that 2012 is going to be a tipping point. I don't think it's the end of the world. I think it's the end. See, when you research it, you come to find that the end of the world scenario that everybody keeps talking about and pushing. The Mayans were misquoted. It's not the end of the world. That's the end of an age. And hopefully that's the end of the age of ignorance. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to break. Got some clips for you coming up. Welcome back. It's January 1st. 2012. Start of a new year. We'll break back. All right, so you're going to ask me, Popeye, the American public, I know they're dumbed down. But they can't be that dumb, right? Mm. We still have our work cut out for us. That's all I'll say. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But that light is also enabling me to see all the crap in between it and myself. So it's not going to be an easy ride. We'll get through it. I'm not worried about that. We'll get through it. But man, is it going to be a bumpy ride. Now, RT went out and they did their man on the street thing. And they wanted to see, you know, are Americans paying attention to, um, are America, do, you know, do they pay attention to what's going on? Do they actually know anything, anything of any importance? So here's the clip. I'm going to play it. Now, of course, their studio is in the studio that they, they went out. Uh, it was their New York studio, and they went out on, you know, on the uh, street in New York City. Now, you would think New York City, huge city. They got hit on 9-11, right, by quote-unquote terrorists. You would think that these people would be up on, you know, uh, foreign policy, everything else, but no. Check it out nation how they plan to lead it into the future some have been exposed for lacking basic knowledge of foreign affairs it seems the general public is following suit as rt's anastasia Cherkin had discovered and, and the angle they go on is they show a couple of clips so you'll hear it where uh, these um the idiots that are running for president you know they they make stupid they make stupid you know statements or they say something stupid you'll hear uh, you'll hear it and then you know, pretty much they're saying, well, how are the American public supposed to, you know, pick a, a, you know, how are they supposed to know to pick, you know, somebody that's going to talk about important things when they themselves don't really even know what the important stuff is. Check it out. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> He's looking to, to actually fire tens of thousands of federal workers and eliminate an entire cabinet level position. And he couldn't even remember its name. They asked me who's the president of you, Becky, 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 Stan, Stan. I'm going to say, you know, I don't know. Do you know? It's not the fact that he doesn't know. It's the fact that he doesn't think he should look it up. So you agree with President Obama on Libya or not? Okay, Libya. The basic knowledge of those attempting to spearhead a country can leave much to be desired. Where does this leave Americans choosing their politicians and their country's potential future? Let's find out. Uzbekistan, I've heard of it through uh, Borat. For some reason, I don't know anything about Libya. Do you know what Uzbekistan is? No, I do not know what Uzbekistan is. For some reason, I don't know anything about Libya because you're a self-centered tart. That's why. Because you bother to pay attention. The only thing you, you might pay attention to is once in a while <clears throat> CNN or maybe MSNBC. Guarantee you the guy being interviewed does not watch Fox News. Not that they tell the truth either. Okay, so But I'm not even going to bother saying he watches Fox once in a while because I, I highly doubt it. Okay, And he's probably too busy watching Dancing with the Stars, Bravo, or something else to give a crap. So, yeah, it's your fault, moron, for not knowing what Libya is. We continue. Uzbekistan? No. Do you know the U.S. is an air base there? No idea. What do you know about Libya? Not much. Do you know how to spell Libya? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Do you know the United States was involved in a war with Libya? Okay. (laughs) Do you know? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Stupid American shoppers. This dumb idiot and his wife. She's even dumber. She's the one laughing. <laughs> We're at war with countries we shouldn't even be at war with. <laughs> Idiots like this are the reason we have problems. Oh, why? <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, I know absolutely nothing about Libya, honestly. That was the Air Force guy in his camis. What about New Mexico? Is that a state or a country? Uh-oh, what is that? <laughs> Why is that you should be on TV because he's so dumb. <laughs> Who's the vice president now? Um, it's the old man. Under Bush. Uh, wow. I actually... Come on, it was not that long ago. You were oh, 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 Cheney, yeah. Who is the vice president of the U.S.? You know, I have no idea. I know it's Barack Obama, but... The vice president? Cheney? So who is the Secretary of State? Condoleezza Rice, still? No. We would be fools and knees to ignore their purpose and their plan. Some countries are at the top of politicians' list to attack verbally and literally. But how much do people really know about those faraway places? What's going on? Give it Tehran. to me. Yeah, it's Iran, yeah. Who's the president? I'm with your dad. Who? I'm with your dad. Do you know who the president of Iran is? No. The yeah, capital? Capital of Iran? Air Force guy. Do you know the capital city of Iran? Um, negative. Do you guys know what Iran is? Of yeah. course, yes. yes. What's the capital of Iran? Who cares? <laughs> Who's the president? Who's president? He just died. What about the capital of Iran? The capital? Yes, I do. What is it? You're asking me? I can't tell you that either. Top secret. Come on. I don't know why it's bothering me. It's not Libya. It's uh, now they're looking at pictures of Ahmed, Ahmadinejad, or however you pronounce his name. He's like Osama. He's the president of Iraq. Iran. I Iran. Right. All right. Do you know his name? Medajedajaf or something. When it comes to picking a future for the U.S., choosing what comes next may be tough without the knowledge of what has gone on in the past and even the very present. I couldn't have said it any better myself. So how are we supposed to sit here and guide our ship into the future when people don't even know where we've been? So how would they know, how would they know, or how will they know if we're going back into the same type of tyrannical stuff that we tried to get out of? They won't. They're frogs boiling in the pot. They don't care. I mean... These people really, the video is even better because you should see the looks on their faces when they're being asked. You heard the one girl, the th there was three girls being interviewed and she, the one girl walked away and you heard her say, oh, uh, we, I shouldn't even be on TV because, you know, we, we're going to look so stupid or something to that effect. Well, that's, I mean, she knew how dumb they were. That's one of the girls being interviewed and she said, you know, we're going to look stupid on TV because, you know, we don't know nothing. But I guarantee you she didn't go home that night and do any research. I guarantee you she went home that night and probably put on some stupid show, probably turned on the, the, the you know, uh, the, the, what are the, the real bimbos of whatever county or whatever state they're in. They try, to tell, they try to tell young girls that that's what a real housewife looks like. Right. That's why we're dumbed down. Because our role models are idiots off of television shows. People are learning their their news from comedy shows. Oh, I just watched this show because they're topical. And people are so ignorant in this country. I had a conversation at one of these Occupy events with a guy who told me that freedom is not really a good thing and complete freedom really isn't a good thing. And, you know, the Constitution gives people too many freedoms. American citizen saying that we all, including himself have too many freedoms and that, that, that the Constitution grants to people too much, too much freedom and that it's a good thing that the government steps in and, and, and locks people up for things. I, I, I looked at the guy and I said to him, so freedom is a bad thing. Well, too much freedom is a bad thing. And he tried to explain it to me and I let him talk for about a minute and then I cut him off and I said, you're not making any sense. You're not making any sense. I said, so if I came over to your house and kicked in your front door and just started rifling through your stuff, that's okay. And he's like, no. 
You're violating my rights. I said, but if the government does it, it's okay. That doesn't make any sense. Time to wake up, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to break. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. In the second hour, I will have a video set up for you. I don't want to play it now because it's about – the video itself is about 26 minutes, and I want to play uh, most of it for you. So I'll, I'm going to take up about three segments with it because I have to break it up uh, for commercial breaks. But um, it's about 26 minutes. It's by uh, Cindy Peister, and she's the uh, the lady who did uh, on the uh, dark side of Aldora, A Soldier in the Shadows, and that's the the movie I played some clips from. When I did my show about PFC John uh, Needham, and I explained who he was, and I played some of the stuff, uh, just a, a little bit of audio from the movie, and uh, Cindy's going to come on sometime, but um, she uh, sent me a link to another video that they just recently put up, and I did an article about it on federaljack.com, and uh, you can watch the whole thing there, but I'm going to play the audio from it today during the second hour. And it's going to be some hard stuff to listen to, just like the stories were of what you heard the day I was going over PFC John Needham's story. But uh, you need to hear this. And I think the females in the audience and the, uh, any female veterans will appreciate me playing this. It is about uh, – it's a former Marine, and she speaks about her own rape – uh, multiple times she was sexually assaulted in the military, in uh, the Marine Corps. And the culture, how it's part of the culture. Uh, and you'll hear her talk about, uh, you know, her female drill instructors telling them and her and the other girls, uh, the other females that recruits that, at, at Paris Island, you know, be prepared for this because this is what you're going to be treated as second rate citizens. It's really hard to listen to, but, but you know, the truth isn't always pretty, so... We have to hear it, and I will have that ready to go for you. Again, I need some. I need like three segments, so I don't want to start it now and then get hit by the uh, the top of the hour break. So, hour number two, I'll play the uh, interview with this Cindy's interview with this former Marine, and you'll hear what she went through and her story, which is even this is the worst part. Her story, it's not like it's a one once in a you know wild type thing. This happens more often than not. <sighs> it just pisses me off. This disrespectful scumbags that do that. I, I really have a, a special hatred for rapists. Someone very close to me was raped. And at the time, I was uh, too uh, young to do anything about it. So I have a, uh, this very dark desire to, uh, to uh, avenge that type of thing when it comes to rapists. I have no compunction about breaking their knees and uh, causing them copious amounts of physical pain. I think rape is actually worse than murder. Anyway, I, I've seen what it does to somebody. So uh, when you see it with your own two eyes, it's horrible. And it shouldn't be happening in the military. And it happens to men, too, by the way. Guys get raped, too. But this is a big issue with uh, females in the military, and it needs to be addressed. I knew a female that was sexually assaulted in the military. Plus, a separate friend of mine who was female and in the military... Uh, she used to get sexual advances constantly because of her looks. So I know from firsthand experience, you know, what these what women go through. And I, I know guys will say, well, they want to join the military, but n this is different. This is like out of control type stuff. When, when, you know, again, you'll hear it when I play it. Anyway, I want to play for you something really quick. I, I took the video I found uh, that I, and I had re-uploaded the one I was telling you about with the, uh, the media coverage of 2007 going into 2008 as opposed to uh, 011 going into 012, okay? So I want you to listen. It's about four minutes, and I want you to listen. Now, the first, it's going to be the coverage from 2008 when, you know, Barack Obama, and then you're, the next is the coverage from this year. And just, I mean, you'd have to be dumb not to hear the, the drastic difference between the two. It's, it's incredible, you know? The Indians used to used to say the you know they speak with forked tongue, they speak out of both sides of their mouth. Listen, 
story for a moment. And to be honest, it's very likely tomorrow night's top story and the next night. The once every four years Iowa caucuses. We're all watching what happens there because so much rides on the people of Iowa. For a state with fewer than three million residents, Iowa packs a big political punch. It is not only the first test, it's the first real test after months and months of talking. Iowa caucus voters do care about who's going to win in November. Right. Iowa caucus voters do care about who's going to win in November. Right. Iowa will play a huge role in the 2008 race. This is the big day in Iowa. It is the big caucus day in Iowa. You have more influence on who the next president of the United States is going to be than anybody else. So um, what effect, if, uh, well, if, if any, do you think that uh, tonight's numbers uh, the results of the caucus are going to have on the upcoming primaries in New Hampshire oh, and South Carolina. Huge, huge, huge. I mean, it, it. And that, as clearly as anything else, speaks to the importance of the Iowa caucuses just six and a half weeks from today. Nomination. I think Mike Huckabee wins Iowa pretty cleanly and goes on to get the Republican nomination. We've got a chance to make history on January 3rd. Be a part of it. Make sure to show up to caucus. Let's go change the world. If you if you win this election, yep. you change the rules of modern American politics. That's what's on the line tomorrow night. Barack Obama, the senator from Illinois, the junior senator from Illinois, has won. The Iowa caucuses, the Democratic caucuses in Iowa, the first big test of the 2008 presidential campaign. I'm telling you, Keith, history. This is Lexington and Concord. This is going around the world right now. Oh, God, I can't stand Chris shivers up his leg, Matthews. Oh, what a scumbag. <laughs> They said this day would never come. Because tonight what we have seen is a new day in American politics. It starts That's here. the coverage of Mike and Huckabee Iowa, but it doesn't end and Obama here. in 2008. It goes all the way through the other states and ends at 1600 this is Huckabee Avenue speaking. one year from now. Now... Here's the Iowa caucus 2012 coverage. Are the Iowa caucuses important? Remember, this is after Ron Paul. Sure the Iowa caucuses. This is after Dr. Paul takes a commanding lead in the Iowa polls. And first we start with none other than Rachel Maddow. It's really like the rest of how we vote in America. How democratic is the Iowa system? If Ron Paul wins, some Republicans are going to say, who cares about Iowa? Do you think that it is uh, American in the modern era that Iowa gets to go, go first? And um, I think we might actually be seeing something bigger in the works here, the demise of Iowa. The hard truth here is that Ron Paul winning Iowa itself would not matter very much. If Ron Paul wins here, what then? Well, the Ron Paul people are not going to like my saying this, but to a certain degree it will discredit the Iowa caucuses. But I wonder if there is an extent to which the organizational principle of Iowa does make it not only less democratic, less representational, but a little bit more corrupt. I mean, if Ron Paul wins, then then what? Then you Iowa go, to, then Iowa go to New Hampshire Iowa and start from scratch. Iowa, Iowa doesn't matter. Uh, at the end of the day, Iowa doesn't matter. Start from scratch in New Hampshire. I totally agree with that. I'm at it would make the caucuses mostly irrelevant, if not entirely irrelevant, if Paul wins. That result would also mean roughly. And that was good old, that, the, the male voice you heard just before Rachel Maddow came back on was none other than the Young Turks, Cenk Uger, another loser sellout. Nothing to the rest of the presidential race. He doesn't like Ron Paul and he's not going to like Iowa if they have the bad judgment to vote for this guy. Uh, all this noise is going to come to an end relatively soon. Maybe Ron Paul wins Iowa, but who cares? Soon. Maybe Ron Paul wins Iowa, but who cares? Yeah, I'm going to say that House Democrats are the Iowa is not only a weird system for picking somebody, they are a non-representational system. in this. I think Iowa may lose its power politically if they do that this time. What does it say about Iowa? So if I was a uh, chairman of the Iowa Republican Party, I'd be a little concerned here that the state's credibility is being undercut. If Iowa took him seriously and Iowans took him seriously, maybe we shouldn't take Iowa all that seriously. I'm not, let's not even talk about what happens in Iowa. I, I'm not, let's not even talk about what happens in Iowa. I, if Ron Paul wins Iowa, we just take it out. I, it, I, 
when you watch it, your speeches, you're like, are you kidding me? I mean, one man, ladies and gentlemen, one guy pisses them off that bad that they have to react like that. That's not reporting. That's not reporting. And they wonder why they're going down like the Hindenburg or the Titanic. They do it to themselves. They shoot themselves right in the foot. Mainstream media sucks. We're going to break. We'll be right back. Vote for Ron Paul. Piss off the establishment. If you want evidence that we're in a police state, ladies and gentlemen, I'll show you evidence. You, I, I don't have to, I mean, aside from the, you know, the stormtroopers and, you know, stupid retarded laws and black bagging citizens and all this other stuff that you, you, you see on a daily basis. This is how you know when it's getting down into our, our states and our, our, our local areas, our cities, when you have things like this happening, the story of a man, a disabled man, former Chicago police officer, who had his service dog taken away from him because of breed restrictions. This is the kind of crap that we need to stop. I, I've missed him for almost two weeks. And it's just good to have him home. An Iowa service dog has been reunited with his disabled owner, at least temporarily. Jim Sack is a retired Chicago police officer. He moved to Iowa in November with his service dog, Snickers. Uh, but the city took the pit bull mix away, saying that Sack had violated a citywide ban on pit bulls. Uh, Sack sued the city to get his dog back, and a judge ordered that the dog can return home until the lawsuit is resolved. Well, of course the, the dog can re return home because the judge knows the law. A service dog, once a dog is designated a service dog and it has been trained as a service dog, the dog is considered a human being. It has the same rights as a human being. I know because I have two service dogs. They go to restaurants. One of them has been to the Guggenheim. So, yeah. Service dogs are allowed to go wherever they want. But you get some overreaching bureaucratic scumbag. Well, the dog's got part pit bull in him. And because of a stigma. And because, yeah, pit bulls have attacked people, but usually those are the, own, the dogs that are owned by scumbag owners. I was attacked by pit bull. I don't hate them. A couple weeks, actually, it was a few weeks right before 9-11. Ironically, it was about uh, a four weeks, you know, about like four weeks before 9-11 happened. I had gotten attacked by a pit bull. I was going to uh, uh, tow a customer's car and a guy up the street whose pit bull was kept outside, not on a leash, you know, and starving and hungry. And it was raining, uh, charged at me. And when it came at me, I was forced to defend myself with my mag light and beat the dog off of me which I, I beat its head in and it let go and it went back to the house. But I don't hate pit bulls. I'm not afraid of dogs. I don't walk around going, damn, we should exterminate dogs. We can should get rid of pit bulls because I'm not stupid. I understand that it's a case-by-case -case basis that things should be judged on, not some blanket judgment. I use common sense so I don't punish everybody else. One of my closest friends in the world owns, uh, well, now I think it's only two. Uh, one of them died. But he had three pit bulls at the time. I've played with all of them. I would roll around and wrestle with them and give them kisses, and they would you know, lick my face. It's how you raise an animal. But unfortunately, those dogs, which were raised for fighting, and they do, you have to breed that out of them. But a lot of, a lot of the times, the... You get an aggressive dog, and then you get a crappy owner who doesn't teach the dog you know, any respect or, excuse me, show the dog any respect or give it any love. He just teaches it you know, cruelty or smacking him or hitting him. So the dog only knows that, okay? And the dog's going to react just like a human child would react. So I just can't stand this breed 
this breed restriction crap, and it really pisses me off when they go after old people who are disabled, who can't defend themselves. It fires me up. Maybe it's because uh, I have people that I love that are disabled, and I could foresee them going after them, and I I wouldn't tolerate. I don't know. All all, you know, all all I do know is it fires me up to the point where it's hard for me to describe with words the anger I get when I see this kind of crap. Really pisses me off to no end. I'm sure you could probably hear it in the tone of my voice that I'm not joking around and this isn't for, you know, this isn't for radio laughs. I'm really pissed about this. This this kind of stuff irritates me to no no end. I swear, it makes me so angry. Because they start with the handicapped people first. They go to the old people, the people that can't defend themselves. And that's cowardly. And that's what, the, that's what these New World Order scumbags want to do. They start – it starts with that. So they push that kind of uh, attitude. And then these local little you know, shysty scumbag governments, you have people that are – Power tripping douchebags who want to just, you know, rah, you know, I have the power, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe they're angry with life. Maybe they got beaten up their whole life. And you know, maybe their whole life they feel that life and everybody in it took advantage of them. So now they're going to get back for whatever reason. You know, maybe they couldn't be a cop and they even failed the mall cop test. So now they're in charge of a condo association or something. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that happens. And you get these power-hungry, bureaucratic little morons. Somebody that – look, again, <clears throat> you only need one person to be a sociopath, right? So out of a group of like 10 or 20 people, and he has to be in charge, and that's it. And that's what happens. You get these, they, you get these people in local city governments because good people don't want to get involved because politics sucks or – you know, the new gen- generations are taught that politics is boring, and you're not cool if you get involved in politics. You're cool if you're a, um, an heiress who didn't earn a penny of her fortune, who gets in trouble for driving while intoxicated and gets caught with cocaine and all this other stuff. Or you're some Hollywood starlet who, you know, constantly gets arrested for shoplifting and doing drugs and everything else. That's cool. That's who you should emulate. That's what's pushed down people's throats and our children's throats. That's what it's cool. But it's not cool to be involved in politics. So kids don't grow up wanting to be involved in politics. And boys, it's sports, you know. So they don't want to get involved in politics. They don't care. And if they do want to get involved in politics, it's usually at a much later age. And by that time, most of the people that want to really get involved are corrupt. Good people don't get involved. It's unfortunate, but it's what happens. And it's because it's made to look so bad. Politics is a very dirty game. That's also done for a reason because, hey, if you muddy the waters and you fill the waters with blood and guts, only the sharks are going to want to swim in it. The regular fish aren't going to want to swim in it because they're not going to be wanting to swim around their friends in entrails and blood and pig blood and everything else. But sharks, they love chum, don't they? They love blood in the water. You know, Plato, I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but Plato talked about this. He said pretty much, if you don't, uh, if you're not willing, if you're smart and you're an intelligent human being and you're not willing to get involved in politics and, and governance, be prepared to be led by people who are of less intelligence than you and may have less um, morals than you and may not care about the same things that you care about. Be prepared because if you're not willing to get involved, those are the people that are going to get involved. And that's what happened. A lot of the good people don't want to get involved. They're scared. Do I think that the general public of this nation are all evil and want to go take over other countries and kill people and do horrific things? No, I do not. I would be an ignorant tart to say that. I believe the people of this country have hearts and are good. And if they truly knew what was going on, if they truly understand the scope of things, it would be over 
tomorrow morning. That's how fast we could change it. That's if the American public knew and understood the truth. And a lot of people get frustrated. They say, oh, these people are so dumb. Don't forget, we all came from that very same um, brainwashed group of individuals. Some of us were just able to see it faster than others. But at one point or another, we, we were all idiots for even if it was a brief period of time. So try to have a little humanity when it comes to dealing with these people. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. I know dealing with people that don't want to listen to you is one of the most difficult things ever. Try to mix it up. If you know someone that's close to you that's, that knows about this stuff, maybe you can tell someone that they love and they can tell someone that you love because I, like I've also said, sometimes explaining to your loved ones <clears throat> is hard because they judge what you're saying based on a personal level because they know you. Whereas maybe if they meet somebody and they, they you introduce them to somebody, you let them feel comfortable, you know, and then maybe that person brings up stuff and they start talking about it, they might take it from that person different. I don't know. It doesn't work with everybody. It's worked with some people. As I've said a thousand times, everybody has their own little key to unlock the door. But that key for that door exists inside of all of us. That's right, Leonidas. It's time to stand up, get our swords and our shields, and say enough is enough. And if we all stand together, they won't be able to penetrate us. Just like a phalanx, they won't be able to penetrate us, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned for hour number two. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two. This is Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. Feel free to check out my website from time to time. I uh, try to update it. Usually I update it every day. Past uh, couple weeks, it's been you know every other day, basically, because uh, I've been in the the midst of moving and stuff, but, uh, I am back up to, uh, updating it daily. So check it every day. Uh, there is a lot of stuff on there. Uh, there's a lot of, I usually post stuff that nobody else likes to talk about because sometimes people don't like to, maybe, I don't know. They don't like to touch certain subjects. They don't like to broach things. Well, that's my specialty. And I make a lot of enemies for it. There are people that don't like me because of what I talk about. Well, that's too bad. You know, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's, you know, some of us, somebody has to talk about it. So if I got to play the part of the guy that, you know, brings all this to light, well, then I guess that's my job. You know, I, maybe I'm strong enough to uh, to handle it. Other people, some people, I guess, aren't. Anyway, uh, it's really important to talk about what I'm going to talk about now and what I'm going to play. As I said, in hour number one, I'm going to play. Uh, Cindy Peister's interview with this former Marine. And um, ladies, for the ladies in the audience, I know I have a, uh, a, a rather large female audience for the ladies that are there and listening. Um, it's going to be hard for some of you to hear, but uh, I'm, I'm playing it because this needs to get aired and these women need to, to have their voices heard. And um, it, it's really important. So, And it's an ongoing epidemic. It's really... it's. It's unbelievable uh, how much this is actually going on in, in this country and in the military. It it really – it doesn't make every veteran bad either. This doesn't mean that every vet on the planet is a bad guy and that they're all you know blah, 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 blah. It just means that when you embrace the dark side, as I talked about with um, – uh, in the movie that uh, – Cindy did uh, about John uh, Needham, PFC John Needham. When you embrace the dark side and you you play with it, it permeates you. You can't just, you know, oh, my morals will stop it from getting through. No, it'll permeate your soul and you won't even realize it. And the next thing you know, you're playing with someone's brains in your hand. So uh, I want to show you the the evil side of of – what happens? And again, this happens to male veterans as well. This just happens to be one female veteran's 
experiences. And you'll hear her say that other veteran, other females, uh, you know, gave her the, the same stories. So for the women out there that are afraid to talk, uh, for the women out there that can't talk, I'm going to play this interview that Cindy Peister did. And uh, I hope this helps give you ladies a message. And if anybody ever hears this, if any of you ever have uh, been sexually assaulted or if you want to get something out about things that you saw in the military and you're a veteran, feel free to contact me at info at federaljack.com. Again, info, I-N-F-O at federaljack.com. And uh, if you want to come on the show and you want to do an interview, uh, we can do that. If it's a time crunch thing, we can always do pre-recorded. I will, uh, I'll move mountains, whatever I got to do to give you some airtime so you can get your story out. So feel free to email me. All right. Now, without further ado, I want to play Cindy's interview. Thank you for joining Pulse TV. I'm your host, Cindy Peister. Today, we are joined by Deborah Slagboom. Deborah was raised in Ventura and enlisted in the Marine Corps. Over the course of her service, Deborah experienced uh, multiple sexual assaults and rapes by her fellow Marines at Fort Meade and Paris Island. And although this is a very difficult subject for her to speak about, she's uh, joined us to discuss this with us all. Thank you so much for joining us, Deborah. Thank you for having we me. We really appreciate having you. Thank you. Um, would you like to just give us an overview of your story? Uh, yeah, I, I joined the Marine Corps um, here out of Ventura, California. Um, I was raised here. Um, I, you know, went through MEPS and then was um, sent to Paris Island. This is all in the year December 08. Um, was when I hit the yellow footprints. So the female Marines get sent to Paris Island and I was sent there, um, went through my cycle, graduated um, sometime in March as a Marine, went to military combat training in Camp Geiger, um, North Carolina. Um, from there went to my uh, military occupational school in Fort Meade, um, Maryland. Um, and then from there was uh, sent to Paris Island, South Carolina, where I, I worked. And um, during that time, um, I experienced the assaults and the rapes um, at my MOS school in um, Fort Meade and Paris Island. Uh, while you were speaking, you mentioned MAPS. What is MAPS? MAPS is where they go and they just kind of check you and make sure that you're mentally and physically fit to serve. So how is it that you came to join the Marines in the first place? Well, you know, Cindy, that's kind of a convoluted story. Um, I was... It, it really goes back to socioeconomics and um, kind of actually hunger. Uh, I was in Oregon. I couldn't finish my education um, and continue with it and um, didn't have a place to stay. Uh, the, the jobs were just had vanished. And so I found myself li living in and out of homeless shelters. I was barely 21, 22, living in and out of homeless shelters. and. Um, just trying to find food wherever I could. And at one point I was living under a bridge and winter was approaching and I didn't want to be stuck in Eugene, Oregon with the winter. So I went down to California, um, asked my parents if I could just, you know, stay at their place. And I was going to go to San Diego. I didn't have a plan. I was just going to go to San Diego. And I looked, I was depressed. I was actually, you know, just thinking I should just there's no reason to continue when um, I looked over and my brother had a Marine Corps pamphlet and I thought well why not I'll have room and board and three meals a day like I, I I'm, I'll do it and the next day I walked in the recruiter's office and I joined I see and um, would you like to talk to us about the sexual assault the circumstances surrounding that how that all began sure um, you know I think it's kind of a convoluted journey because Sexual assault in the, in the military kind of begins um, with, I really believe, the culture of violence. Um, so, you know, at the offset in boot camp, we had some really great drill instructors, um, but we were taught, they were just amazing women, but we were taught as female Marines um, in boot camp that we were, you know, we were going to be singled out. And so from day one, um, I was aware as a, as a recruit that, I was a second-class citizen as a Marine female. Um, now, this is not, you know, the rhetoric that the institution will tout, and, and you know, they say everybody's equal. 
but the drill instructors never for a moment let me forget that um, I would be seen as either um, a, excuse my language, a slut or a, a female dog. Um, so I, I entered military combat training and the rest of my education um, with the belief that uh, I had to really work harder than my male counterparts. Um, and as soon as I entered Fort Meade, um, it was just kind of this welcome wagon of just everybody wanting to kind of jump into bed with you. And I just remember having to fend off a lot of male attention. And um, I finally ended up in a relationship with a young man. And as soon as I did that, it was like all the harassment, all the, the knocking and, you know, kind of the catcalling just ceased. And unfortunately, that relationship um, although it began on a good note, ended up going towards a path of domestic violence, uh, beginning with uh, verbal abuse. Um, you know, your your sleeves aren't rolled. You're humiliating me. Um, your hair isn't right. I mean, just really kind of the nitpicking that kind of goes on with your sergeant to you. But he he started doing it to um, uh, pinching and slapping or kicking me um, if I didn't get get it right or if I said something um, and then finally it escalated to a forceful intercourse to all right I'm gonna stop it right there we're coming into a break so stay right there ladies and gentlemen don't go anywhere as soon as we come back coming in from the break I'm just gonna play the clip again so don't go anywhere I'm gonna pick it up right where we left off um, forced intercourse to, um, I, um, was, I date raped and, um, eventually just repeatedly raped and assaulted. And, um, I, I have actually some of the things that began, if I could read them, that I documented and I'm, I was, just felt like I didn't have a voice. So I started keeping a diary and, um, I have kind of lists of, I'm tired of being yelled at. Hit me again and see what happens to you. He keeps hitting me. He pinched me. He punches my arm or my shin. Um, to he gets me so drunk I can't remember anything. Um, and I caught him in the act when when I was sleeping. He's like an angry person I can't get rid of. Um, twisting my jaw cruelly until I submit. I mean, it just, I kind of, it was just a slow escalation that took place over six months. And I didn't realize it was domestic violence until one day uh, he did it in front of my friends. He started strangling me in front of uh, our peers. And that was kind of a line for me because these were Marines that I had to, that these were men that I had to prove, I had worked to, to get this reputation of being a good Marine. And here he was showing them that I was defenseless. And uh, so the next day I broke up with him and um, he didn't take that well. He actually threatened to tell the command that I was a lesbian, um, which at the time before, this was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, so that would have ruined my career. That was a charge for getting out. Um, so he threatened to tell my chain of command that I was um, a homosexual. Um, and uh, actually, uh, he ended up stalking me um, and then tried to assault me in public um, in a dance, dance disco when I was a designated driver. I was watching several friends and he tried to assault me and another woman. So um, that was just kind of the nature of that relationship. And um, come to find out, I'm one of many women, female Marines, that had that relationship kind of relationship with their Marines core spouses or partners. Um, you know, it didn't end there though. Um, as soon as I stopped dating him, the harassment began. It was like he kind of, it, having um, a, a man in your life um, that was present, that was a Marine, made kind of the other dogs, as it were, go off, you know, go away. And then as soon as that was gone, um, you know, I started getting one AM texts from friends, um, come down to my room, have sex with me. Um, 
I had a Marine coworker that I worked with slapping my thighs and buttocks and saying, you know, um, I would do all these things to you and then dump you. I'm just really degrading things. Um, uh, I mean, just really degrading. And, you know, I became friends with this one individual and um, caught him one night. I, I think he was on duty. I, I don't really remember. And at this point, I had become so depressed about my environment and what was happening to me. I started taking sleeping pills and um, drinking heavily to sleep um, because I had nightmares and I couldn't sleep. And uh, he, this person, snuck into my room and I woke up to him raping me. And I, he was a friend. He was somebody I actually called a brother. And um, I had another friend. Um, you know, drag me to his bed, pin me down and say, you are supposed to date me. Why didn't you date me? You're mine and you're, you're being this and this and this. And then, you know, begin to go down that road. And I'm thinking, not again. And another Marine steps in. It just so happens he was so drunk, he left the door open and another Marine stepped in and saw him and, and he was like, hey, let's you know, pulled him off and was like, hey, let's just take another shot and forget about it and calmed him down. And he escorted me up to my room and I turned around to think, and I'm like, thank you for getting me out of that situation. And he was a corporal and he looked at me and he was like, oh, great, how about, how about you give me some sex? How about we do it? And I just remember thinking, you know, from the, the frying pan into the fire, you know, now I owe you. And there were so many other harassments and um, assaults that seem minor in comparison to these incidents. Um, so it, it just took place over the course of my career. Um, I had a corporal try to blackmail me into sex um, because he knew my, I had later married an officer, my husband, who I'm currently with, who's, and uh, he knew that I had married an officer. He found out and uh, I was trying to keep it on the DL because that could have been a career ender for my husband and myself. And he came up to me and he said, um, I, you better have a, a sexual relationship with me or else I could report this. And um, yeah, I, I just have too many stories like that. Deborah, while you were talking to us about the incident when your um, former boyfriend started strangling you in front of other Marines. Did they s try to stop and, and help you? No. He was literally strangling me. I couldn't breathe. I was blacking out and he was slamming me up against the wall. And these three or four guys um, had been drinking. They just kind of barged into my room. I hadn't been drinking. I was only sober when they just kind of barged in. And my boyfriend, you know, I, was, I wasn't going to tell my boyfriend to leave because I was afraid of him. And they just just stood by and watched and laughed. And actually one of those, the, the Marines that had been watching, um, you know, after, after I broke up with my boyfriend, he started uh, harassing me at work with slapping, slapping my butt and thighs and saying degrading things. Um, <clears throat> did you report this? Um, you know, that's kind of a convoluted history and actually that's been the point of criticism by some Marines, oh, you didn't report this. And um, the reason why I never officially filed a report, um, aside from actually kind of just being kind of, I don't know, brainwashed into thinking this was all normal, um, was because I had seen other women file reports. Um, a girl actually from the same barracks hall uh, reported that her boyfriend raped her and she had a trial drag out and she w he was acquitted and she was sent away. And uh, it was just a horrible, she, she never got justified. And then I'd seen at Fort Meade, another girl was actually in my class, a good friend was raped, dumped in front of her d detachment. Um, and she was NJP'd because she was intoxicated and um, she was underage and intoxicated. So that would, was what happened to her. And I'd seen, I had a sergeant tell me about her domestic violence case. And she was just like, oh, well, you know, he beat me every night and he was finally caught and he was um, he was reprimanded and we finally got a divorce. And so I'm thinking this is normal. 
what does NJP mean? It's a non-judicial punishment. Um, basically, the command is kind of an informal way of uh, punishing you without going to a trial. The command has just full authority to punish you for whatever they feel that you've violated. So is what you're telling me... Which NJP usually ends up being like 45 and 45, which is 45 days restricted to base and 45, uh, uh, 45 days... Um, they take money away from you. Usually they'll take like half your pay or whatever. So it's 45 and 45. And when I was in the guard, it also meant 45 days of, uh, you know, extra duty after you got off. So you'd have your normal, you know, work day. And then after that, you'd have to stay for an extra four hours and do, you know, pick up garbage, scrape paint, do all that stuff. So 45 and 45. Restricted to the base, boss of pay, and treated like a slave. So I imagine what they did to her. All because she was, you know, she was the victim. She was raped. Let's not forget that. This is what happens when you bring the dark side in, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. But when a woman does report it, is that the man tends to get off and the woman is punished? Well, you know... Not officially. The Marine Corps encourages us to report it. Um, however, you know, that varies by com from command to command. What I have seen is that when a woman goes to get help or report things, uh, like go to the medical office, she's asked about 50, I forget how many questions, 50 something questions, we've got 52 questions, and they include, are you married? Was your perpetrator married? Is he Marine? Um, were you underage? Were you drinking? Um, uh, what rank are you? What rank is your perpetrator? And by the time you get through these questions, uh, you end up getting in trouble for something. Because if he was a married and your um, officer, um, a superior officer in any you know way, that's fraternization and adultery right there. And you have to prove that you um, were innocent of this. And I've seen uh, victims of these crimes never come forward because they know I'm going to get charged with um, underage drinking or uh, frater you know, fraternization, like one rank disparity fraternization. And I've seen it. And nobody wants to step forward. Um, I hate to break our train of discussion. Yeah. But I want to catch something that we maybe have missed earlier. Did you say something about a drill instructor, um, a, talk, a slut talk, slut talk? Yeah, slut talk. Um, I, I kind of nicknamed it the slut talk. This is kind of where the violence and the, the um, desensitization towards domestic violence comes from. Um, and this, the ide ideology that we're second class. Um, the first month, we all sat down and... Uh, she, our drill instructors started telling us, You're the, one of you is going to be the one. One of you is going to be the one to get pregnant and write out your, your enlistment pregnant. One of you is going to be the one to um, uh, sleep with all the guys to get ahead. One of you is going to be the one to cry rape when it wasn't rape. Um, and you're going to trash our name. You're going to trash good female Marines that have worked so hard. You're going to trash our name. Um, and we've worked so hard and we're not seen as equal to the men and we're seen as a walking mattress the moment we enter the unit we have to fight against this and so it was well intended it was a well-intended warning and i think they would have been wrong not to warn us but it was like a prediction like this is going to happen we were told you're going to have wild um intercourse with strangers in the bathroom stalls um at at your at field training um when you get the chance and uh I mean, just the low expectation that we were going to do this. I mean, these are girls that are 17, 18 years old. And to, say, to, to condemn them from the offset, uh, you know, uh, are you trying to get them to do this? Um, so, yeah, you, you, you immediately realize that you are going to be seen as a slut and, um, or you're going to be, become one. It seems as though, from what you're telling me, that it was just repeated, uh, a kind of a perpetual environment yes. that took, that was uh, ongoing every day, like a 24-7 kind of yeah. uh, 
environment. Is that what you're saying? Well, in boot camp, you know, it just kept sneaking in almost, I would say, every day at least in, in some manner, um, whether it was a girl not being able to do pull-ups. You know, you're going to be seen as the weak woman who keeps back the rest of the pack. And, you know, there's some truth in that. Um, or to the... Um, you know, the kind of extreme of you're going to be the walking mattress that everybody uses. I remember one time we were um, doing a obstacle course with some of the male recruits and uh, one of, you know, you're just kind of looking around and one of the drill instructors came up to me and this other girl and was like, keep your nasty eyes to yourself. I know what you're doing. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about all the sex that you can have once you get out of this uniform. And it's like, you know, no, no, I wasn't, you know, there's, I was completely innocent in my thoughts, you know, and you're, you're painting, you're training me to be this person. And I remember the night before um, military combat training, the girls from my platoon, we all got together and five out of seven of us, um, five of the girls that I was um, staying at the hotel with, they invited some Marines into their rooms, two or three at a time, and just went at it and some of these girls were married and I remember pulling one aside and being like why are you doing this and she was like well they they think this of us anyway well, you know I'm already I mean, in a sense I'm already damned so why not I'm I'll just do it I haven't committed the crime I might as well enjoy it if I you know um yeah they just can't escape from the stereotype so for you you're afraid or you decide that it's not in your best interest to, to report it, what do you do? Um, are, are, do you remain silent? Do you get help? What do you do? Um, well, you know, I try to get help medically. Um, I had a miscarriage because of the rape um, and because of negligence on the part of um, some of my superiors. I um, was in my, almost in my second term and um, they put me on a march and I had already had a heat stroke and I miscarried. So um, I have uh, had a lot of cervical damage um, as t and, uh, you know, um, damage um, in my reproductive organs from that. And so I've gone to the medical officers and I started going to them and they, they have these kind of PA questions that they ask, you know, um, alcohol, you know, sexual assault. And I, said, I'm drinking a lot, I can't go to sleep at night. I have nightmares of being raped. I'm afraid to go to sleep and I've been raped and um, actually I have uh, sexual diseases and um, t t tissue scarring from the rape. And um, I was getting cysts even from the, the damage. And uh, I never, they never put that in my medical file. They never said anything to me. The doctor just, I don't know what he wrote down. He just, it, it's not even my medical file. I never got a call back saying, hey, you should go in and get help. And I told several medical professionals, um, nothing. So you have cervical damage as a result of the violence of the rape? And yeah, the, and the miscarriage, yeah. And how, how many miscarriages have you had? Well, um, since the one that I had in the military, my husband and I have, I've gotten pregnant with my husband once or twice, twice, and both times I miscarried. So are you in jeopardy of not ever being able to have children now? Never is a strong word, um, but it looks like it will be very hard, yeah. very, very difficult. So what did you do? Okay, so now you've gone to the doctors to get help and, and you're saying that they didn't really give it to you? They just, they just acted like it was normal. Yeah. They just checked the mark and said, oh, you should get some help for that. Well, where? And then I was, the next patient walked in for the, you know, or I was sent away. Yeah. Okay, so essentially you're not getting any help within the military and you're still continuing to be assaulted and you're still having to deal with all of this stuff um, and you're drinking and you're to get some sleep yeah. and you're having nightmares. Um, what about psychological help? 
Well, my sergeant had, um, I had a, a really good sergeant and unfortunately he left really short into my stay at Paris Island. And he was like, I'm signing you up. I'm calling for you and sending you to the, the psychiatrist. And I went, um, and the psychiatrist just looked at me and I told him all these things and he just said, oh, you're bipolar. And bipolar is um, something that can, you can get out for. And at the time I didn't want to get out. So I was just like, I, I left his office and I never saw him again because if I get treated for bipolar, um, with bipolar medication, I have to report it. They have to know that I'm on it. I might not be able to stand duty and do my work. And then that just further perpetuates this cycle of being a second class Marine who can't contribute. And I would be damned if I had to get on report that I was on a medication for being bipolar and possibly face a medical board and get discharged for that. And that was my option. That was my medical help. Okay. What? All right. Let's try. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there's only about uh, maybe like three minutes left of the interview, so you guys could check the rest of it out on uh, my YouTube channel. It's up there. The title is Former Marine. Uh, let me give you the proper title because I'm going to screw this up. Hold on. It is Former Marine. Sexual trauma and rape are dangerous in military culture. We'll be right back. 9 was an inside job. They lie, they scam, they cheat, and steal. They plot, they fun, they act, it's real. They watch, they hunt, they punish, and kill. All right, so why did I play that clip? Why did I want to play that clip? I played that clip because it was important for you guys to hear her story. And that's just one story. Now, I know about this stuff, about the, the epidemic of military rape because of the research I've done. But I found out about it because a friend of mine in the guard was raped, which uh, eventually led me down the road of, I wonder how many, how many people this happens to. And then you look it up and you start to look at statistics and you start to do research and you're just astounded. Now, you may wonder why would I give three segments to, to her story? I don't know her. Well, I don't. But I know her story, and I feel her pain, and why wouldn't I give her you know, airtime? It's important for people that don't get a voice to get a voice, and that's particularly what I consider my job to be. Um, whether it's you know Judith Baker getting an outlet so she can give out this, you know, the important information she knows about cancer as a bioweapon and Lee Harvey Oswald and the JFK assassination or be this girl. Everybody is as equally important as everybody else. And I'm not trying to bash the military in any way, shape or form. Unfortunately, this dark evil has perpetrated the military. Uh, you know, the the military has not always been knights in shining armor throughout history. There have always been bad things that have happened. Unfortunately, when uh, you embrace the dark side, the bad things become more frequent and good people get sucked into doing bad things because man is corruptible. And war has a tendency to bring out the very worst in people, ladies and gentlemen. And that is why we should avoid it at all costs. Because the culture we are creating is a war-crazed, uh, desensitized culture. That doesn't, the, the citizens that aren't involved in the military don't even pay attention to what's going on. And a lot of good people in the military become turned into evil. Things that maybe they would not under normal circumstances become. Evil has a way of bringing out the worst in you. And even if you're not evil at heart, it can, you, you can be taken over. You can be turned and unfortunately, there are also sociopaths. 
there are people that join the military just because they want to be able to hurt people and it's you know they know they'll be able to do so there so you also have that but that's really honestly uh there's not that many like that the men men and women that i've met uh ranging from the time i was in to veterans i've met ranging from world war 2 till now actually i also met a uh Oh, well, he was a World War One veteran, but he's gone now. Um, but, you know, most of the guys, people I've gotten to uh, talk to and hang out with, you know, at least from World War Two, you know, till current time. And most of these men and women didn't join up because they wanted to be tyrants or they wanted to do this evil type of thing. So this is not everybody. Unfortunately, as I said, when you embrace the dark side, as we did after 9-11, the military culture gets taken over. And, you know, my father had a problem uh, relating to certain things when I was active duty. Now that we're veterans, it's different. But when I was active duty, he couldn't understand, and this was 10 years ago. Uh, he was a Navy man himself, and he couldn't understand certain things about the current way that the military did things. And he said, I don't understand, you know, 40 years ago they would have done this. And I kept explaining to him that it, it's not the same military, and it's not. And unfortunately, that comes from, you know, bureaucratic policymakers. And, uh, uh, you know, people like the, you know, whoever happens to be the current puppet president or uh, people in uh, the Pentagon, you know, people, certain people of high ranking positions. Fletcher Prouty talked about them. They're called the secret team. Usually they're CIA agents and other forms of government. Anyway, they push certain things because it's an agenda of a larger group. So no, it's not your daddy's military anymore. It doesn't mean you should have any less respect for the Marine Corps, the men and women who serve it, who are good. It doesn't mean you should have any less respect for the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Air Force. It just means you need to understand that this stuff happens, ladies and gentlemen, and not many people maybe want to talk about this because they don't want to get, you know, piss off certain veterans. I I'm a vet. I get flack from other vets. Most vets that know me or have hear my show, you know, email me or, or you know, they'll let me know in the chat room. Or however, if I talk to them, and they tell me that you know, th they thank me for talking about the stuff that you know other people won't. Once in a while, you get some brainwashed moron. Nine times out of ten, he's not a vet. Nine times out of ten, he's probably still enlisted and it's usually on youtube and it's usually anonymous so you never even know if the guy's real or not but it usually it'll be oh you're a traitor because you talk about this type of stuff well you know what no i'm not these women deserve to have a voice the men that get raped in the military deserve to have a voice veterans deserve to have a voice and if you if people aren't you know if they don't have the balls to stand up and say something then i will and if that means that some people might not like me because I'm willing to talk about this stuff, then you don't have to like me. I'm not in this to be your friend. I'm in this to bring real information to the table. I'm not here for my ego, so it's cool. You don't have to like me. You can actually get mad at me for being the one to bring this if you'd like. You know, bring this forward and show you, but if you want to blame me, that's fine. You know, some 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 people need to be the play that part. And they need to be the ones that bring this to light. I don't like this. I wish it wasn't happening. I wish this was all some weird movie and it was not true. But it's the truth. And these women signed up and they took an oath. They went through the same hell that I did. That was boot camp. The least I could do is give them a voice. And it's reprehensible that it happens to begin with. Military men and women, well, I, women, I, 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 I'm sure there's cases where a woman might be the rapist, but I'm sure that's few and far between. Um, military men should hold themselves to a higher standard. And I know it's part of the quote-unquote culture, but again, if they're willing to do that to their own, what do you think they're going to be doing, willing to do to the enemy? And if some of these are turn, if some of these very same people are turned against the, the the citizens, what do you think they would do to us? 
that's the culture that's being bred into the quote unquote new world or war la la the new world orders warriors there is no morals and stuff like that so we need to wake the military up fortunately they are waking up very fast but we need to step it up because that is the evil that's what the evil will do to them if they if and a lot of these guys go un, unknowingly they don't realize what's happening and some of them, uh, I don't have any, I have no sorrow for you guys that witness somebody getting raped and don't do anything about it. The least you could do is shoot the guy raping the girl. You know, they'll have to arrest you and you'll face a court martial, but then you'll at least bring up to the, you know, it'll be brought up that the guy was raping somebody and you, you shot him or snap his neck or do whatever you got to do, you know? Maybe you don't have to kill him, you just break his jaw and uh, both his arms. You know, maybe uh, kick him in the balls. Do something that it would have to be brought up. Somebody would have to ask why that was done. You shouldn't stand by. You're not a real man if you stand by and let some chick get raped. That's not cool. And you're not cool either if you stand by and let some dude get raped either. That's, that's what going to the dark side does. That's what embracing war does. Trust me, when I was in the military, I, I, and you embrace war, you, you see it turn people. And I saw friends of mine become people that, you know, were foreign to me. So you don't want to let you don't want to let it permeate into into uh, into your soul. You don't want to let it touch you like that. And war is one way that this evil does that, this dark side, this whatever you want to call it. And look how the culture doesn't care. They're apathetic. Whatever. I don't care if we bomb brown people. Well, it's coming to your backyards, ladies and gentlemen. This is the kind of stuff that's going on right now, and we need to stop it. Or we don't stand a chance. This is Sparta! It's time to get our balls back, stand up say enough is enough and again if you're in the military and you see a female in the military getting raped and you don't do anything you're a coward that's all I have to say about that thank you for listening ladies and gentlemen I'll see you again on Wednesday evening at 10pm until then happy new year Semper Fi I'm out